and then begin to relax, consciously letting go, inviting the body to become more deeply relaxed. And as we begin to feel the body relax, let us turn our attention to the breath. And feeling the breath as it comes in and goes out, we make that the focus of attention for a few minutes so that the mind might come to a state of quiet. Feeling the breath, we begin to now focus the breath in the heart chakra to awaken the energy of love and acceptance. As we deepen in meditation, let us ask of ourselves what is our heart's desire or what is next for us in our unfolding. Let us be as clear as we can, or maybe we don't know, but we ask now what is not mine to become. Let's play a little game with ourselves and see if we can feel what it's like to already be there, to feel, perhaps to image, to think from where we are going, what we are becoming. Place yourself in that place and be that. As we sit in silence, let us be what we will be.
give us this day our daily bread you said you would supply all my needs according to your riches i have but to ask and i shall receive to go from here and share this love you gave to me to show someone who's lost and help them find their way the way to truth and faith so they can be free like me free like me Lord we are your peace Lord we are your peace Lord we are your joy this day Donna, thank you for, I, I, y'all may not know this, but she had 15 minutes to prepare. Uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> Maybe 15 minutes in a lifetime. I don't know, that might not be fair to say 15 minutes. I, before I forget, I want to say that we, there's an interface service today at 2 o'clock at um, Greystone Baptist Church on Lead Mine. It is uh, in part been led by one of our members, Tammy Johns, and so I hope you'll consider going there. I think we have flyers, maybe. Uh, if you don't, you can come ask me. I have some details on how to get there. It's been an interesting week for me uh, this week in Lake Wobegon, and um, <laughs> I have had um, and as a writing assignment. I was a river guide, as many of you know, but I was. Uh, uh, but this is a very special company called Sobek that did international river trips. Uh, they did trips everywhere in the world that, that um, they could, largely being third world experiences. And so I was in Africa and Borneo and South America and India and, you know, that was me, but they did many, many more than that. And among uh, the people that I really respect the most in this world were many of the guides that were there. We had a reunion a couple of months ago and decided to write a two-page article each and compile it into a book about our personal experience. And so many, I've read a few of these and, and some of them talk about a specific event where they were, it's usually where I was there, the hero, right? It's like, and there I was, you know, I did this. And, uh, and some of them are, are more general. Um, I, I found when I was writing mine, I was telling the story of how I got there. And basically, I got there because I had a girlfriend who said, I just love adventure. And I went, well, if that will get your eye, I'm going for it. And so I became a, a Grand Canyon River guide. And from there, I went out to do these international trips, et cetera. Um, but when I stopped is, was the core of the story. I was in Borneo, and I had been in uh, a kind of learning, uh, actually trying to become a spiritual leader uh, by learning how to meditate, dream interpretation, energy work, reading books, going to seminars, et cetera, for about seven years when I was in the heart of Borneo, and the river was too high for the rafting that we were going to do. We were filming this uh, for television, and um, they decided that maybe we could send the four kayakers there, of which I was that one, um, down the river. And if we did that, uh, they would have something they could put on film. I was sitting on the steps of a tiny church in the middle of Borneo. I mean, what are the odds? 
you know, Dyaks aren't known, I didn't know they had any Christian churches, but there was one right there in this little village, talking to the videographer that would be kayaking with me, and, um, and I told him, uh, I was nervous about the trip, et cetera, and he says, well, you know, I wouldn't go if you don't feel like it. And I, what really struck me was that if I died trying to do another first descent, I'd really be pissed. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so I, I declined to, to do this, and, and therefore we didn't have anything for television, and to some degree, they had to really punt and try some other way to put together a film. But that really, it was only a year before I went to seminary, which, you know, at the end of 13 years of preparation, I was finally ready to be a unity minister. 13 years, I was, this is actually going somewhere. Um, <laughs> On that trip was a TV announcer that had worked for ABC Sports, Diana Nyad. And if y'all know who Diana Nyad, she is the, the woman that swam from Cuba to Florida. 52 hours and 57 minutes in the water, 110 miles on her fifth try. I, she hadn't done that yet when I met her, but I wanted to compare and contrast our two experiences. First of all, the decision not to do the heroic thing for me was my heroic thing. Because I had done a dozen first descents in several countries, I didn't really, I didn't feel like I would gain much from doing it, which is why it would seem like a waste of my life to try and fail. But more importantly, it made me make a decision about what was important to me in another way, in front of my peers, although they didn't know what was in my thought process. But in this letter, in this my little two-pager, I've explained it to them. That essentially I had, this was my calling, was to, to go toward the spirit world. And I had had my adventure, and it was now time for me to take that next step. And the seven years prior and the six years after this were all in preparation so that I could do that somewhat. And the purpose of all that time and prep um, I sometimes tell this in, in heroic terms. It was like Odysseus coming back from the, the war in Troy. And if you know the story of the Odyssey, he comes back having lost everything, down, and, and actually been shipwrecked a couple of times, and having been seduced by um, uh, whatever those things were, and, um, and having face the Cyclops, etc. All these adventures had honed him down to being a real human being again. And he comes to his town, his island of Ithaca, and he is shipwrecked on the way in and comes as a beggar. And in some ways, sometimes when you go, when you want to go home to yourself, you don't go home as the hero. You go home as the beggar. Now, it wasn't long before he was king again of Ithaca, but, but this breakdown of the human so that something else can emerge is essentially what I'm talking about. And so this breakdown for me was that I, in that moment, and not only <laughs> that, but in that moment it was giving up some identity that I had had before. Um, one of the guys, one of the daring do's who would take a big chance just to do something ridiculously inconsequential. And now I was just, I was actually going for something 
of deeper meaning for me. And that was a loss of identity for sure. Now Diana Nyad, on the other hand, had to adjust herself to the difficulties of swimming 110 miles, encountering the worst thing she encountered were these um, jellyfish, the sting of which one tentacle is usually enough to make someone nearly paralyzed. And she would swam into them and had them on her body and they ate away at her skin and it was horrible. And she did this attempt five times. So she might be out 20 hours and fail because she'd be caught in the Gulf Stream and the Gulf Stream would form an eddy and she'd be going backwards. And so this endurance, not only of the 110 miles, but of coming back and training every year for years to be able to do this, this is a honing of the human spirit also. It is making you into something by stressing you to see if you really, really want it. This day's talk is about becoming who you really want to be. And there are several ways of doing it. Some are by loss and some are by gain. But I want to talk to you on the spiritual terms, not like I'm a, a motivational speaker. You know how they do it. Make your list. Be bold. If you, it's not a scary goal, it's not worth doing, right? I'm, it's inspiring when they do it. But I want to talk to you starting first with Taoism and then with Christianity. So some of you know Taoism, which is spelled with a T-A, with a T-O-A, Tao. It is not uh, a religion in the same sense we have. It is a philosophy. It is a philosophy that says the closest thing that we can compare the Tao to is water, that it seeks its own level, that it never tries but it always succeeds, that nothing can resist it even though it's the softest of elements. The Tao does not put itself out as being something special. It is what it is. Now, this Tao, if we follow the Tao and we want to live as a Taoist, we follow a way of being called the Wu Wei. And the Wu Wei is often translated as non-action. But non-action is kind of inaccurate. Non-action means in this situation, you don't push against it. You wait until the right moment. You, you know, when the door is jammed, you don't push against it, you jiggle it. You know, when someone you're dis is disagreeing with it, maybe you back up and just wait and not push your point. In a war, you might retreat until the right moment to advance. You follow the way of things. You follow the grain. You don't go against the grain. You are like water. You adapt to the circumstances you're in. Instead of asking everything to bend to your will, you find a way to flow with it. This is the Wu Wei. It would be Aikido if it was a martial art. You know receive and let the energy pass. This is the method of following the Tao because you are in alignment with the Tao. The Tao is universal. It has always been here, but most people don't pay attention to it. Most people are still trying to make it happen, right? So this trying to make it happen works. It has been the way of the West. We have forced, we have disciplined ourselves, we have pushed, we have tried, we have manipulated, we have thought, we have been relentless. You know what they say about white people, right? Well, they may have 
you know, kill the Indians and they may have enslaved people and they may have destroyed much of the terrain, but you got to say they've been busy. <laughs> that is not the Tao. The Tao flows with, is part of, that's probably the most important thing. It is part of nature. And so art that is influenced by the Tao might be like a Japanese painting or a Chinese painting in which nature is 95% of the picture and then down there is the guy in the boat. Not much of human is front and center. The whole of it is what the Taoist paint. And so, it, and there's a great story about a man who falls into the river. Confucius is watching this. A man, old man, an old man falls into the river and, and the guy goes, Confucius goes, well, he's probably just killing himself because he's miserable. Because it comes right onto a big rapid. No way he could live through that. Well, it turns out, a few minutes later, he pops up at the bottom of the rapid and gets up on shore and starts to walk away. And Confucius sends one of his disciples after him and says, bring him here. I need to see how he did that. And the guy says, well, I didn't really do anything. I just was, I became the water and I put it in at the top, I took out at the bottom, right? That's the Taoist way. Let me read you something from Christianity. In the first page of the Gospel of John, they're talking about what's really a Greek idea. And the Greek idea is the idea of the logos. And describing the logos is just about as difficult as describing the Tao. Because we call it the word, but the word doesn't mean, it's in, the, in a dictionary, it would be two pages what the logo is, the definitions. The logos, you might describe it this way. The logos is the vibration, the core vibration out of which everything begins to form, or the crystalline idea around which things happen, or the intent. So, it's, you've heard these words before, I'm sure. In the beginning, the word already existed. The logos already existed. And I'm going to change a few pronouns here. It was with God. It was God. It was in the beginning with God. It created everything there is. Nothing exists that it did not make. Life itself was in it. And this life gives light to everyone. This is the Tao in Greek terms. This is the force that runs through all of nature. This is the force that runs through us. This is the force that creates. This is the soul of it. It is the vibration of the universe. It is the thought that creates and it is not static and past tense, but is ongoing. That is the Logos. That is the Tao. And so when we go about becoming something, our job is to really figure out how to get in line with the Tao and how to use the aspect of the Tao which we have control over. Does that make sense? So if you could be like the man who swam the rapid, you could just relax and the Tao would carry you. But he had no place to go. He's an old man. He's not trying to make him anything of himself. He's just living life, right? Now, in the West here, we're probably not adequately accustomed to this idea that I should just be who I am. We want to become something. And the way I think to do that and yet to be in alignment with the Tao and the Logos is to do it vibrationally. Rather than doing it by effort, by external effort, do it by becoming. 
that which you want to be first. Or as Jesus might say, pray believing. Now when you hear pray believing, it's like, oh, I, I want to be a millionaire, and you go, I believe I can do it, you know, which gets you nowhere. You need to become the vibratory equivalent of the millionaire if that's where your destiny carries you. And don't pick a destiny that is against the Tao, right? Don't pick a destiny that says, I will dominate the world. Pick a destiny that is, supports the world, that adds to the whole. So the tree doesn't come into existence so it can take over the territory and give nothing back. No, the tree is part of the whole system. And your becoming needs to be part of the whole system. And your becoming can be accelerated, accelerated by imagination, by shifting your energy, and by becoming. Now, if you watch the movie about Diana Nyad learning what she needs to know and trying to swim across the gulf, hers is not really the Taoist way. Hers is, I will do this, and you will help me, and I will do everything in my power to make it so. And so for the first three quarters of the movie, it doesn't go well for her. She swims really hard. She's stung by different jellyfish. She's, she has a very tough time. It's really only when she finally, at least if the movie's right, when she finally relaxes in enough to let others join her as friends rather than as servants, that the whole thing takes over a different tone. And somehow she succeeds this fifth time trying to swim from Cuba to the United States. I think it works that way for us. When we align ourselves, not, I don't even like the word align, when we vibrate like where we want to be, we become magnetic to the success that is in agreement with that. When you begin to be the lover, then love comes to you. When you become the hero, whatever that means for you, then the possibility of others seeing you as the hero and you acting as a hero have exponentially increased. And then if you don't push it, then you will do it in the right time and place. You have to wait on the Tao, the world to shift with you, but you speed up that process by being that ahead of time. And then the success isn't at the cost of others or yourself. The success is part of what's happening now, the flow. So there's a lot of conversation in athletics about the flow state, which is where you're actually skillful enough to do it, engaged enough that you're not distracted, not anxious, not pushing, not pulling, but in the flow of your own ability, and now you're completely absorbed and all things seem to work together for your good. This is the flow state. And this is the state I think we need to practice where we move our being toward where we want to be vibrationally, not just by effort. In the East, it's common that people do pilgrimage to different holy sites. And why do people go to holy sites? So that they will get in, the, in this ashram or they'll get in the cave or where a, a, a mystic has lived for years and they will begin to vibrate like the mystic they will begin to take on that vibration. And if they can hold it, then they will begin to be like that saint. They will begin to have those experiences. And many people have to go multiple times because it's a foreign experience, but they are going to have 
the vibration start. And your imagination and your intent and your logo, your logo, your word is what they're, they're, talk, they're trying to activate in themselves. Though you have it too. You can decide a thing or as it says somewhere, you can declare a thing and it shall be so. Not because you have manipulated it, but because you have become it. This is the process, I think, of praying, believing. It's the process of being the Logos. It's the process of using your Christ nature to affect the world and yourself. And when done in this way, I believe we do it without harm. You know, one of the things about being willful is sometimes you get what you want, but the cost is enormous, either to you or someone else. But in the Tao, in the flow, using agreement with the world instead of fighting it, we are able to move the world and ourselves without so much loss. So this is my hope, that this idea might take root and you might go, ah, oh, so. <laughs> I try the easy way. I go with instead of against. I say yes instead of no. I say I'm okay rather than I, I'm not worthy. I relax, but I also intend. I choose because I too am part of nature. I too am part of this big scene, even though I'm just the boatman down here in the corner. I am also part of nature. And as such, I have the right to put my imprint on it. Not because I'm over it, but because I'm in it. Your right to choose, to become who you wish to be, but do it by becoming rather than doing. Let us pray. Let's think of a time in our past in which everything came together with ease and grace. And remember how that felt to be in the flow, to know that all things were working together for good. It was like we could declare a thing and it was so. And it worked. And we were that. And now let us imagine what we wish to become. And see that. And imagine what it would be like, how it would feel, what we might think or say, who we would see, who would help us, who our partners would be. And then feel the world as it is. And let us tune into the world and see if our vision, our desire has a home there. And maybe we make adjustments or maybe not. Mm. 
And if it seems like we're in the flow, let us practice feeling like it is already here, feeling like we are that. and begin to allow it to pull that which you wish to you and you toward it. With ease and grace. 